All right, well, let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, we're continuing on this. And it uh, seems like we're getting a little bit of speed here because the concepts now are, are a little bit simpler. And probably after this lesson, they'll get difficult again. But uh, we're talking about uh, Jesus is what? Greater. greater. Jesus is greater. And I'll just give it to you. He's greater than the, the prophets. He's greater than uh, the angels. He's greater than Moses. And right now we're talking about he's greater than who? Aaron. Aaron. That's right. And so in chapter 7, verse number 7, um, he is greater than Aaron because uh, Aaron, through Levi, was in the loins of his uh, uh, ancestor Abraham. And uh, when Melchizedek had an encounter with Abraham, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And therefore the one who blesses is greater than the one who is blessed. Uh, verse number 8 of chapter 7 of Hebrews, we see here that uh, uh, Jesus uh, is, is eternal. Melchizedek was eternal. He had no beginning or end. And that is a way in which he is greater than, uh, than Aaron and the Levitical priesthood. Verse number 9 in chapter 7, we see that uh, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. And the one who pays tithes is always subservient to one who's receiving tithes. And so there we have that again. Uh, number four, in verse number 21, uh, God swore an oath. And in that oath that he swore, which he did not swear with the Levitical priesthood, he said the Messiah would be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So it's a, a, God made an oath, and he swore on himself because there was no greater. And we discussed that. Uh, verse 24 of chapter 7, uh, it kind of goes along with the second point, but the, the priesthood of Melchizedek and of Christ is unchangeable because he liveth forever, whereas uh, the Aaronic priesthood is always changing because they're dying. Uh, number 6, in verse number 26, we see that the, the Aaronic priests were, were human and therefore they were sinners because all have sinned and come short of God's glory. Whereas Jesus is sinless, and therefore he was not only the suitable high priest, but he was also the suitable sacrifice. When he died, he didn't die for his own sins. He didn't have to make a sacrifice for his own sins, but instead he made a sacrifice for our sins. And then number seven, we got to that last time in chapter eight, verse six. It says, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much better also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. And so we see here that the seventh thing here is, is that Jesus is uh, the priest of a better covenant. Now what does that mean? Well, let's look at verse number seven, and this is where we begin. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Now what's another word for covenant? Testament. Testament, that's right. So the Old Covenant was a works-based covenant. Uh, you do this and I will bless you. Uh, the New Covenant is a covenant of grace. Now the word faultless, I can just imagine the translators just uh, struggling over that word because there is no, technically there is no fault in the Old Covenant because the Old Covenant, the Old Testament was given by God. But what, what he's trying to say here is there was something lacking here in the Old Covenant. What was it that was lacking? Well, we go to verse number 8. For finding fault with them, that is the, the Old Covenant uh, and its, uh, its priestly system, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, in verse number 8, uh, the writer of Hebrews begins to quote, from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And so we've seen him quote and deal extensively with Psalm 110, verse 4. And now he's going to deal with Jeremiah 21, uh, 31, verses 31 through 34. All right. So it says here, finding fault with them, with the old covenant, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, quoting from Jeremiah, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 
that it seems like there's a lot of very helpful things in, in the Schofield Reference Bible concerning the book of Hebrews. And one of the things he does is he has a footnote talking about the new covenant. And here's some thoughts that he had. Number one, better than the Mosaic covenant. Not morally, but efficaciously. <laughs> now this is, I think, one of the things you really need to get. Uh, morally, the old covenant is just as good as the new covenant. Because who gave it? God gave it. There's, there's no... You know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. But efficaciously, <laughs> the new covenant is better. In other words, in its ability for us to be saved, to be forgiven, it is better. Uh, look at Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. So there's never a reason to say the Old Covenant, the Old Testament is trash. There's never a reason to say that. And that is actually blasphemous. Because who gave it? You know, God gave it. And it has its purpose. But it says here, in verse number 3 and 4 of Romans 8, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through what? The flesh. The, flesh. <laughs> the reason... The Old Testament, the Old Covenant cannot save us. It's not anything due on God's part. It's all to do with us. Because we're sinful. And we could not keep that law perfectly. It says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak to the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, he did not have sinful flesh, but in the likeness, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so we see the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant, the law, uh, the fault with it doesn't lie with God. It lies with us because we're not able to keep our end of the bargain, which is you obey me perfectly and then I will bless you. That's the Old Works Covenant. All right. Number two, it is established on better, that is, unconditional promises. In the Mosaic Covenant, found in Exodus 19, God said, if ye will. But in the New Covenant, he says, I will. I love that. <laughs> that is just some good stuff. That'll preach, as they say. But uh, look at Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. And we see here the Old Covenant laid out. Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. It says here, God speaking to Moses, uh, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and you could say, if ye will keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. If you will, if you will keep my covenant, if you will do what I'm about to tell you, then I will bless you. That's the old covenant right there. But as we look at the New Covenant, verse number 10 of chapter uh, 8 of Hebrews, the words that stick out. It says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Verse 12, For I will be merciful to their right, unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. What's going on here? The difference. You will. That's the old covenant. But God says, I will in the new covenant. So we see here it's, it's better in that uh, we're able to be saved through the new covenant. It's better in that it's based upon better or unconditional promises. It's what God's going to do for us. Number three. So under the Mosaic covenant, 
Obedience sprang from fear. Under the new, from a willing heart and mind. Uh, verse number 10, which is once again quoting from uh, Jeremiah 31. Uh, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and will write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And so this is talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, the, the example I always like to give is, is uh, Charlie Sturgill, the old pastor over at Independent Baptist Church in Pound that I thought so much of. And, uh, you know, someone came up to him and he said, well, I drink as much as I want to. I'm talking about alcohol. And someone said, well, you know, I thought you were a Baptist. You know, he said, well, I just don't want to drink anymore, <laughs> you know. And that's the key. The old covenant, you've got these rules and these regulations Thou shalt, thou shalt not. And you, you try to obey them, and you try to obey them, and you end up failing. You end up failing. I was talking with someone yesterday about someone who was just really, and I said, you need to be in my Sunday school class because we're going through this exact thing. But this person would lead in prayer. This person would encourage other people to come to church and just uh, would get after other people who weren't living like they should. Then all of a sudden, the person just snapped. And all of a sudden just went astray and is out of church and is not doing well at all right now. You say, well, what happened? Well, I think a lot of people are living under the old covenant. And I said, the difference is they're holding on and holding out. And uh, what happens is sometimes your, 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 your grip gets a little loose and you fall. And eventually you fall enough times and you get discouraged and you just give up. Just give up on the whole thing. That's holding on to God. But John chapter 10 says that God the Father and God the Son are holding on to us. Ephesians says we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And so that's the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. It doesn't mean we're made perfect under the New Covenant. No, sir. You know, 1 John 1 says if we say we have no sin, we're a liar. And we make God a liar. But we have a new desire from the Holy Spirit living within us. God's law, not written in tablets of stone, but written on our hearts. And so in that way, we see here that uh, there was fear under the old covenant, but under the new covenant, there's a desire, a willing heart, and a willing mind. Number four, the new covenant secures the personal revelation of the Lord to every believer, to every believer. In other words, uh, the, the old covenant would go through a priest, but the new covenant teaches the priesthood of the believer that we have direct access through Christ. And then uh, number five, the complete oblivion of sins under the new covenant. We're going to learn that under the old covenant, you know, there was sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice that could put away no sins. But now we have, under the new covenant, one sacrifice, once for all, Christ, that can put away our sins. And number six, the new covenant rests upon an accomplished redemption. It is finished. <laughs> we don't need to be sacrificing over and over and over again. So that is a contrast there that Mr. Schofield gives, or whoever wrote this section, between the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. Any questions or any thoughts about that contrast between the New Covenant and the Old Covenant? Before we move on from that. All right, so Jesus is the mediator or the priest of a better covenant. All right, verse number 8 of chapter 8 of Hebrews. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that's Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse 31, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And that doesn't mean the new covenant is limited to the Hebrew people or the Jewish people. But that just simply means that's who he's writing to and uh, that's, he's establishing this new covenant with them as well. They're not under the old covenant any longer. 
It says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. They continued not in my covenant. Once again, who's at fault <laughs> for breaking the, the covenant, the old covenant? Israel. We are humanity. Uh, Israel broke the covenant, not God. Okay? It's a good covenant. It's a good agreement if we could keep it. And the scripture says that the Old Covenant of the Old Testament, the law was given so that we could see that we were sinners and we would seek out a Savior. And so they broke it. And so because they broke the covenant, it says, And I regarded them not. I showed them, uh, I showed them no favor. I, I paid no... Um, I, uh, I wish I could read my writing. I showed no concern. That's the word there. I showed no concern for them. I did not favor them. I did not show them any concern. I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant, still quoting from Jeremiah, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And once again, we see here, the laws of God are now written on the hearts of men and not simply on tablets of stone. There's a desire, even though we're not perfected yet, there's a desire to do what God wants us to do. And through his Holy Spirit, he instructs us in what we ought to do. Verse 11, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother say, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. 1 John 2, 27. This is an interesting verse here. It says, But the anointing which ye have received of him, anointing, when you think of the word anointing, who do you think of? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. So, but the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Now, what this verse is not saying is that you don't need anybody to teach you, okay? Okay. You don't need anybody. All you need is the Bible and the Holy Spirit, and you're good to go. That's not what it's saying. You know, God has set up the church. God has told Timothy to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. You know, God has said we ought to, you know, teach and preach the whole counsel of God. So that's not what it's saying here. But what it's saying here is, is you don't need an ironic priest to break apart what the scriptures are saying to you. But that God has given you a helper, a teacher, the Holy Spirit, who can show you what the word of God is saying. What the word of God is saying. From the least to the greatest. No matter who you are whether you're the priest that was serving in the temple or whether you're just a, a slave that's serving in someone's home. You receive the Holy Spirit, and as, as Jesus says in John, he is able to teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, <laughs> and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And Dr. Gray says this, says one of the benefits of the better covenant is that they bring forgiveness with them. And another point in this verse that we pointed out earlier is, I will, will I. God is going to 
to do it. So here you have, for instance, a contrast here. You know, the children of Israel are in the, uh, are in the wilderness wandering around. Exodus 32, golden calf. They break every commandment there is at that moment with the golden calf. And uh, that deserves judgment. The old covenant says judgment, hellfire, damnation. You've broken the covenant of God. The new covenant says, I have made a way. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And that doesn't excuse sin at all, but it does mean there's a way for the complete, total, utter forgiveness of sin under the new covenant. And one more verse in this chapter. In that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. There's a purpose for the old covenant to show us that we're sinners. But then once we learn that we're sinners and we turn to the Savior, the old covenant is passed away with its do this, don't do this sort of religion. And the new covenant with the desire through the Holy Spirit, with the teaching of the Holy Spirit, with the complete forgiveness of sins through Christ takes its place. Any thoughts or any questions about chapter 8 and the uh, New Covenant compared with the Old Covenant? Anything? All right, well, let's march ahead to chapter number 9. And we're going to see the next thing here in why the uh, Melchizedek or Christly priesthood is greater than the Aaronic priesthood. And that is, he is the priest of a better tabernacle. He's a priest of a better tabernacle. Let's start in verse number 1 of chapter 9. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Now by a worldly sanctuary, <laughs> that brings up all kinds of pictures, doesn't it? Worldly sanctuary, what do you think of, you know? Um, you think of amusements, you know? That's not what it's talking about here, worldly. It's talking about an earthly sanctuary. In other words, here on the earth, there was a sanctuary where the high priest would go. Um, for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. And, uh, and we know that as the holy of holies. So you've got the outer room and then you've got the inner room, the Holy of Holies. It says, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that had budded and the tables of the covenant. And so we have in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle and later in the temple, of the Ark of the Covenant. What are the items that were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant? A bowl of manna, uh, Aaron's rod that miraculously budded to show that, to, to, to verify the validity of the uh, Aaronic priesthood, and then also the Ten Commandments. Now, what is it talking about here when it says the golden censer? Well, let's turn back to a Leviticus. 16, Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. And I believe it's uh, 11 to 13. Yep, 16, 11 to 13. It says, And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself, 
and that ought to put light bulbs in your head who he's making a sacrifice for. And for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, deep and small, and bring it within the veil, then the Holy of Holies. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And so I had some questions myself. Well, what exactly is a censer? It's talking about in the Holy of Holies. But it's a censer which uh, was used to burn incense that uh, the high priest would bring into the Holy of Holies once a year. Verse 5 continues the description of the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant. And over it, the cherubim of glory, showing, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. And what does that mean? We cannot now speak particularly. Well, it means we cannot right now speak about this in detail. You know, he's saying here, I don't have any time to go into detail on this right now, but all the items in the earthly tabernacle. So he gets to his point. Verse number six. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest were always, went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, which is the Holy of Holies, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now, if you've studied the, uh, the Old Testament and this sacrifice that was made, errors means the sins that the people had committed that they did not realize they had committed. And so this sacrifice, which was taken once a year, was for the high priest, and it was for the, uh, for the sins that had been committed that the people could not remember. Okay? And I think that's a type of the fact that Jesus, his blood, you know, some people are real big on confessing sins. And we ought to. If we know that we have something between us and God, or between us and someone else, we need to admit that to God. He wants us to do that. But what about the sins we do not admit? You know, you get to heaven and say, okay, well, you know, you committed this. You go to hell. You didn't confess it. No, it's under the blood. It's under the blood. And that's what we see here on the Day of Atonement. Okay, verse 8. The Holy Ghost thus signifying, and what that means is, okay, there, there's some things that God gives us to show us himself outside of the scriptures. You know, that's not heresy, okay? One of those things was the tabernacle. And all of the things in the tabernacle, they all they pictured the sacrifice necessary in order to approach God. And they, they have significance. And so the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament gave them the tabernacle as a symbol or as a picture of something. A picture is never as good as the real thing. You know, we're getting ready to go out west on a trip, and uh, one of the things we did is we uh, looked up Yellowstone National Park. And uh, you see all these pictures. And it's beautiful, high-definition pictures on our smart TV. The prismatic springs. Ooh, it's just amazing, all the colors and everything. You see Old Faithful Geyser. Wow, Old Faithful Geyser must be this big because... That's as tall as it is on our TV screen, right? <laughs> no, you see it, you'll be like, whoa, it's bigger than I thought, you know? That's a picture. The picture is never as good as the real thing. Well, sometimes maybe if you doctor the picture, in some cases. But it, it, this is the, the picture here. This is a symbol the Holy Spirit gives us. You know, we have symbols today. Baptism is a symbol that God gave us outside of scripture to show us himself the lord's supper is an ordinance which means a picture which where, where god shows us a truth about what christ has done and that's why these are important we should not neglect baptism we should not neglect the lord's supper because you're you're neglecting to show a picture you know i grew up in a church that taught you had to be baptized to be saved you had to remain faithful to be saved all this sort of stuff but every week we did the Lord's Supper. 
And I could see in front of me Jesus broken, shedding his blood. And I believe that thought stuck with me later in life. But, but anyway, but the, the Holy Ghost thus signified. He gave us a picture in the tabernacle that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure, which means a symbol or a picture, for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. What does that mean? The sacrifices that were made at that tabernacle could not perfect the conscience of the worshipers. That's the way I like to word that there. In other words, you go and you make the sacrifice over and over and over again. You go and you make that sacrifice once a year for the sins of the high priest and for the unknown sins of the people. And, and, and it was a symbol it didn't do anything. And if you did not see beyond the symbol to the truth presented there, you're going to be lost because you're still in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. It's like baptism. It's a symbol. It signifies what Christ has done for us. His death, his burial, his resurrection. Baptism doesn't save us. It points to the one who does. And it also signifies what we do. Dying to self and being raised to walk in newness of life in Christ. So with the tabernacle. It's a picture. It never perfected the conscience of those who made the sacrifice. Verse 10. Which stood only in meats, which means foods and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of of reformation. Uh, the word reformation means setting things right. You know, here it was. These were imposed on God's people until they were fulfilled and things were set right. And by the way, carnal ordinances, <laughs> you know, with our current way of thinking about those words, uh, it simply means uh, bodily regulations as well. Regulations of food, of drink, of washings, and regulations on the body as well imposed on them until the time when things would be set right. And next time, as we get to verse number 11, we're going to see how Christ set things right and fulfilled what was being talked about with the Old Testament tabernacle. He's going to go into a better tabernacle.